What's up, YouTube? It's the homie Joshua, helping others move in excellence. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience in the Corcoran Sioux. In particular, what it was like being sold up with two very different Nuestra Familia members, right? So first off, walking into the Sioux is a different experience in itself. Um, I've been to AdSeg everywhere that I've done time. Uh, Solano, Salinas Valley a couple times, Vacaville. But the Sioux is just different. It's a different vibe. And, and it's a different feeling being validated and going to the hole as opposed to going there for, for getting off on somebody. So I go to my cell, I'm in section 4B4 left, right? And I go to my cell and I submit some basic stuff to the homies. They reach out, hey, you a homeboy? Yes, okay. And very basic, nothing detailed, right? And I figure that'll come. They shoot me back a kite saying, hey, an individual with this CDC number and this last name from this neighborhood is going to put in a sell slip request to move in with you, accept that request when the seals come, sign it, give it back to them so that homeboy can move in. And in looking at it, I recognize the last name and I recognize the neighborhood, which was West Side 18th Street in San Mateo, uh, a northerner hood and based out of San Francisco, uh, the old San Francisco hood in 18th Street was a lot of Central Americans and some of them came down and, and set up shop in San Mateo. So anyway, we're going back a long ways, right? So I recognize that name and that neighborhood, but I knew him by a different nickname. And so I wrote the homies back and I was like, absolutely, no problem. I recognize some of this information, but the person that I'm thinking of was named this in the streets. And they, they, you know, they wrote back and they were like, it's the same guy. I said, okay, great, right? And so I'm kind of excited, man, because for one, I'd never met an NF member face to face, right? I never communicated with a righteous NF member, let alone live with one. This is 2000, 2001. None of them were, were on the main lines, right? And so that was kind of exciting for me. And then also that, hey, I've known this dude 20 something years. Um, you know, he went to YA as a kid and wound up catching an L, but but we hung out in juvenile hall. Uh, I went by and hung out with some of his homeboys in the streets. We had got along. He, he was a homeboy of mine personally. And not the same individual I talked about in my San Quentin video. That guy also was, was from the neighborhood, the same neighborhood, um, but his experiences were different. And, and you can watch that to, to see what all that was about, right? So it's a different guy. And so I signed a slip. He's up in the cell a couple hours later, right? Everything happens pretty fast. And he comes in and, you know, we shake hands and hug and damn fool, it's crazy to see you here. You know, did you ever think, man, 20 years ago, we were in juvenile hall together. And now here we are in, in the Sioux, right? And yeah, you know, we kind of expected that, you know, to be honest. So we're talking and he's not in the cell, but... 20 minutes maybe at the most. And he says, hey, did the homeboys tell you about me? And I said, no. I said, you know, they shot me the kite, letting me know you were going to put in a cell slip. And I told them I recognized this name, but as a different, you know, had a different nickname in the streets. And he goes, yeah, you know, I changed it a while back. And, and so this is what I go by. But the homeboys were aware of that. And I was like, no, I get it, you know. And he goes, did they tell you anything else? And I said, no. You know, and I'm kind of looking at him now like, what am I missing, right? And and there's a little intimidation coming into the shoe. I mean, my status was good. My reputation was good, blah, blah, blah. So I wasn't necessarily worried. But anybody that's done time, you know, you go to the hole and you run into cats from different yards. You go to the shoe. You never quite know. And and again, now I'm missing, I'm messing with, with the mob, right? With... And so I, I was a little on edge. And he clears that up pretty quick. He goes, hey, uh, I'm a Nuestra Familia member. I'm a canal. And I was like, wow, okay, right? And he goes, yeah, the, the homeboys put me here to, to help you advance in your schooling. All right, cool. Now, I don't know exactly what he's talking about in the sense that that I wasn't aware that there was anybody in the Sioux that knew how much schooling I had previously, right? Um, I'm sure they knew, obviously, I wasn't an NF member. Um, I was a bro, 
right? Uh, a Nuestra Raza member and have been for a long time. And had held some leadership positions and, and was a teacher and all that good stuff, right? So I'm assuming, oh, he's going to start schooling me in this in this higher education, right? Because I really believed in, in the movement and the cause and all that other stuff. And, and I just assumed that those who were seeds were like the cream of the crop version of us who were who were hermanos, right? And so I was kind of eager for that. And and I had anticipated climbing the chain. Um, like I said, I, I was a true believer. And so it was a logical next step for me. And and my bubble got burst a little bit. So within a couple of days, he starts getting at me about, hey, do you know how to establish a main line? And I said, well, you know, for the most part, I've never been a part of the first or second bus on a yard. But but I get the, the idea. And like I said, I've held various, uh, you know, leadership positions on yards, including having keys to a yard. So, um, you know, I I know a little bit. Right. But but I'm open to more, of course. And he says, down, he's got a piece of paper and diagrams and little squares and bubbles. And he's mapping out what a main line looks like with the buildings and. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I've been to a yard, you know, like it's not all entirely new. I know what prison looks like, but I'm not saying anything. And then he runs me through how to establish a chain of command. And, and I'm not going to get into everything we got into, but the chain of command he was advising me to set up had like, you know, 15 plus people in it on one yard. And I'm like, hey, bro, uh, like, all that sounds good on paper, but I just left the main line in Salinas Valley where there was like 15 homeboys on the whole yard. You know what I mean? And it was a level four rocking yard. And so I, I was like, this doesn't, this is not practical in the sense of what the main line looks like. Now he's like, nah, but this is how you have to do it. And this is why. And I'm like, nah, but all these buffers you have and all these people with so many people in a chain of command, you know, one of them gets popped or one of them drops out or one of them rolls over and they can take down half the COC, if not more. This is kind of the way that, that, that I've done it and the way that I've sort of seen it work. And he didn't like that very much, right? He, he didn't like getting feedback from me. And that's been talked about by other channels on other channels. Um, and by myself, I can be hard-headed. So to clarify that, though, I'm always open to learning something new. I'm always striving for new information. I'm always striving to understand people who see things different than I do. Because just because I think it or I know it doesn't mean that it's right. And so I'm a sponge when it comes to information. But if I know something and you're trying to teach me something different, you have to make it make sense to me. Right? I'm not just going to accept what you're saying because you're a parrot imitating what you heard. And, and there's a lot of people in, in different circles that lack that critical thinking skill. And that doesn't make me better than them or like oh, I'm some genius, right? But, but for example, even in my teachings on the bonds, each bond can be interpreted individually. But if you interpret it in such a way that doesn't match or coincide with every other bond and the format, then that means you're interpreting that bond wrong, right? Because everything has to be cohesive. Everything has to paint a picture that at the end makes sense. So you can't just take one little piece out of the puzzle and and make it say what you want or seem the way that you want. It won't fit back in the puzzle anymore. So, and that's the approach I take in general. And so I went from being excited to learn from this guy to kind of bummed. Right. To be honest. And and I had even got at him and was like, hey, why? Just out of curiosity, like, why are we going over how to set up a main line? You know, um, I'm never going to be back on a main line. Right. At that time, the only way you get out of the suit if you're validated is parole, snitch or die. Well, I wasn't telling. I never did. And I wasn't planning on dying. And so and I had a release date that was years down the road. I wasn't sure if I'd make it or not. I didn't really care. But so point is, I'm not going to be back on a main line. 
So why is there such an emphasis? The first thing that you're that you're schooling me on is to establish a mainline. And most of the people back in the shoe are validated. So it's not even like I was going to encounter a bunch of people who were going to be returning to the mainline at some point. And those that were in that situation, more often than not, they had mainline experience. They had some level of training and education. So they probably knew already. And in kind of questioning this dude more or just talking to him, not like interrogating him, I came to realize he didn't have any mainline experience, right? His first mainline was, I believe, in Jamestown. And he was getting off, right? The, the, everybody was getting off there. So he was getting off on various rivals and spending a lot of time in the hole. Then he'd come back to a different yard and he'd get off and he'd go back to the hole. And that's where he got validated at. So his only real experience prior to the shoe was reception center for however long. And then this one institution where he spent very little time on the main line. And from my experience, when yards are rocking, there's not a lot of schooling going on, right? It's, it's They're schooling around rep, weaponry. They're schooling around strategy. But there's not real... Education is a privilege, so to speak, right? The first thing about prison is survival, you know? And so if you're in survival mode, you don't have the time to run, you know, uh, uh, to run schooling and that kind of stuff. Plus, people are in and out. There's a lot of scrutiny from, from the COs and, and the task force. So for many reasons... I came to conclude this dude didn't didn't really have a lot of mainline experience or a lot of training prior to coming to the suit, which doesn't make him a bad guy. It just means that his skill set and his strengths are different. And so and he's like, well, you know, just because you got to know this stuff. And again, it, it reminded me of you're just parroting. Right. It's there's a lot of people that are teachers. Right. But. Somebody who really knows and believes in what they're teaching, when you ask them a question, they'll have an answer. If they don't have an answer, they'll acknowledge that they don't have it and they'll go find it, right? And they'll come back to you. And so, and these teachings have been around for a long time. So it's not like uh, an emerging thing, right? Folks should know, in, in my opinion, and especially a C should, should know. And so... I was a little thrown off by that, but it was cool. It's my homeboy. And and it was neat to be set up with somebody that I knew. So multiple things like that happened, right? And I had talked about his journey to become a C and, and what he felt comfortable sharing. And he says, oh, you know, I got validated as a, as a Nuestra Raza associate when I was in AdSeg in Jamestown. And that's when I came, you know, that's when I came to the Sioux. And I was like, damn, so you caught a hot one in the shoe, huh? And he goes, no. And my understanding, which, which was an accurate understanding, is the the NF in particular had, quote unquote, blood in, blood out. So you had to shed the blood of somebody in a political act of violence, in an act of violence that advances the agenda, not like, oh, I shot somebody on the streets, you know? Um, and that's why I came to prison, and now that's my blood said that counts. That doesn't count. And so I was like, oh, how'd that work? And he says, well, I'm a lifer, so the homeboys ain't really tripping, and I'm on deck. You know, something came up, I'm down to handle it, whatever. And I have no reason to think that he wasn't. You know, uh, uh, he was in there for a murder. I know the dude, he was a down homeboy as a kid. And so, and he was getting down in Jamestown and getting off. So I'm not in any way suggesting that that he was a weenie, right, or, or whatever. But that was the first time that I'd heard of something like that happening. And I have found out since that, that that is not actually unusual. While the narrative says that's the way it has to be uh, in more recent years, uh, you know, and counting that time that I was in there, 2000, 2001, that wasn't the case, right? So for everybody. And so that's a whole separate thing. But so I'm sitting there, Sally's, and, and there's a guy downstairs who I didn't really know. I'd heard his name. And, and this is one of the reasons that I've hesitated to tell this because as you notice, the first individual I'm talking about, I'm not saying his name, right? I don't feel like that's my place. It's not as if he's a high profile figure that's in the newspaper and, and all that other stuff all the time. And I just don't know. I don't know what he's doing with his life now. Um, it's not my business, to be honest. I don't necessarily care, but I'm not into to just name dropping for the sake of name dropping. 
this next individual is much more well known and much more well respected and also disliked by some. But I wasn't without mentioning his name, it would have been kind of hard to tell the video, right? Um and and so I had asked him, hey, I'm I'm thinking of doing this video. I just want to talk about my experience living in a cell with you while we were in Corcoran. What do you think? And he's like, for you, man, yeah, go ahead. Right? We're still in touch to this day. Um He's one of the best people that I ever met when I was incarcerated, to be quite honest. And so, and he had the keys, right? He had the keys to Corcoran. Um, he had been a C for a long time. And his name was Carlitos from San Jose, right? Carlitos Terrazas out of San Jose. I don't remember the neighborhood. He, I don't, you know, he didn't really trip off that stuff. And so he's like, hey, bro, you're going to move down there, right? My celly, the dude from 18th Street. Homeboy wants you to move down there and and I'm going to move somewhere else. And I was like, all right, cool, you know. And so I thought it was just a, you know, just a cell move, right? I didn't read any, any real deeper into it. And honestly, I was kind of glad. I was kind of glad to get out of the cell with Homeboy just because it, it was an odd vibe, right? And we'd argue and stuff. And I think part of his issue was... He felt like I didn't respect his status. You know what I mean? And it wasn't that I didn't respect his status. It's just that he wasn't bringing nothing to the table, you know, in, in terms of of what he professed to be doing, right? I'm going to help you with your schooling and I'm this and I'm that. And it was a little bit of a letdown on my end because, again, I had this image, this mental image of what Carnaz were all about, and he didn't quite fit that. And so I was happy to go, right? And And he was obviously happy to see me leave. And so I moved down there with Carlitos, right? Now, Carlitos has a much more regimented program. Bro, we were getting up like 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I remember it was the year that 24 came out, uh, that TV show. Because I think it came out at 9 o'clock, and, and we were already in bed by then, right? It was lights out for us, you know, by then. And so I was kind of bummed because everybody's talking about it, and, and I go to visits, they're talking about it, and I'm like, I can't watch it because, and it's his cell, right? So it's not as if I'm going to move in there and be like, hey, nah, Holmes, I'm going to do a different routine. Um, not just because, you know, he he's an NF member or because he had the keys to, you know, to everything. That's just not something you do in general when you're moving into somebody else's cell. You kind of conform to their program, right? At least till you guys get to know each other and, and stuff. So it was a very strict routine. Right. And, and we worked out obviously a lot and and we read a lot and we talked some and he had various little side hustles. And so it's funny because I'd been in there maybe like a month. Right. And we're standing there and we're talking. I think we had just got done with Makina. Right. And he goes, uh, man, I'm glad I didn't have to whack you. <laughs> and I was like, what? I mean, I'm glad, too, but you want to elaborate a little bit and he's like I thought I was gonna have to whack you right because the homeboy upstairs was like oh man this dude's difficult and he's going against the grain and he doesn't want to listen and and he doesn't respect status and all this other stuff and he goes I said you know let me see for myself right and and if you came down here and you behave that way yeah bro I, I was gonna cut you up right um but you didn't you know you didn't and and you are receptive. And I was. But because the dude was sharp. Right? And and he'd been around a long time. Like he was caught up in the 89 indictments. I don't think he actually wanted to do time around that. Uh, I could be wrong. But he's been around a long time. And and he was up in the bay for many, many years. He came down to Corcoran when they started doing that whole possibly active, inactive on the validation level. Not how these folks talk about now. Um and step down programs and that kind of shit. They were moving some people down to Corcoran. He was one of those. He never got accident at any of that stuff. Um, but he stayed. And so, and and I mean, he's he's a hitter, right? He he turned a a really relatively short county jail sentence into, you know, decades in prison, right? And and when he was in the bay, he had a celly and. Uh, his celly came back from yard and was like, hey, uh, I'm done, 
As long as I'm, I'm done, I'm hanging it up, right? And Carlitos tells him, I mean, all right, cool. You know what you got to do? Just bang on the door and, and let the seals, you know, know you got to go. And so he's actually giving him an out, right? And Carlitos was short to the house, but he also wasn't an abusive person. He, he was a very reasonable, thoughtful person. He would never ask anybody to do something he didn't do. And he he had a real sour taste in his mouth for, for those who were like that, in particular C's. And there are some like that. And so he tells you, hey, bro, you got to go, right? And he says, nah, if I'm not I'm not going nowhere. Like, I'm not locking it up. Carlitos is like, okay. So when it comes time to shower, right, in the bay, when it comes down to shower, and I'll talk about my pelican and, you know, bay experience in another video, but when it comes time to shower, you walk downstairs, you pick up your razor from the front gate, you walk up, you shower, one of you on the bottom, one of you on the top. Generally, people just shave in there. You normally bird bath before, but then when you're done, you walk down, put your razor up, they check it to make sure you haven't busted it down, and then you go back up to yourself. So on his way out, he grabs a little golf pencil and, and some string, and inside the shower, instead of showering, he breaks it down and makes a tomahawk, right? And so when it's time to get out the shower, he makes sure that his celly goes up to the front and hangs up the razor first. And when he does, he turns around and Carlito starts carving him up, right? And hits some kind of a nerve. I remember he was laughing when he was telling me. He was like, you know, it's some kind of vein up there. And you hit it and it's like a fountain, bro. It's right there. And, and he was so close to going home that they actually, shortly thereafter, even though he was facing a DA indictment, a DA referral, right, for, for the assault or attempted murder or whatever it was, they put him in a Del Norte County Jail. Right, which is the kind of the Pelican Bay's in. And he didn't last there very long before they were like, nah, fool, you gotta you gotta get out. So he actually sat in the Pelican Bay Sioux uh pending the the results of, of this deal referral and this trial, right? And he picks up another 12 years. And and so that's the level of dedication that he had, right? Is I'm a month away from going home and yeah, I'll carve you up, right? So, but he was highly intelligent and, and, and we went through like the bonds and teachings and stuff, right? And he would tell me, you know, the thing that's most important, bro, you got to learn this because this is what's going to protect you, right? What's on paper, as long as you stay true to what's on paper, then you can't go wrong. People are going to hate, people are going to do this, whatever, but you have the law, so to speak, to, to cover your back, Right? And, and I mean, I could talk about this dude for a long time, but one way to sum it up, I guess, in particular, those that are familiar with, with that end of, of affiliation, right? Northerners, Norteños, Hermanos, Cs, whatever. Um, he, he was what I imagined a C to be like before I met one, you know? And he took the approach of, I'm here to protect and serve everybody else right? I'm here to look out for everybody else. I'm here to provide. We're brothers. He, he was like a really solid uh, hermano, a really solid, you know, NR member with C status. And, and he didn't let that stuff get to his head. And so, uh, and a man of integrity, even behind closed doors, so to speak. So being a position that he had, we had a lot of stuff coming through our cell all the time, right? And and this is when when word comes out that that lizard actually out of, out of Pittsburgh is is flipping and the whole early start of Black Widow. Um, and so he's you know there's a lot of communication, but also whatever contraband came back to the suit came through our cell first. Now he had told me early on he goes look uh, I'm gonna get some stuff here and in particular you know wheelers and shit that I can't let you see, and it's not. You know, it's not a, a, I'm trying to keep secrets from you. It's just some stuff's not your business, right? But if it is your business, if it's not exclusive, right? For example, like constitution stuff or, or high level, you know, NF stuff, then yeah, I'll show you, right? And, and, and kind of walk you through it, right? I'll teach you. So he's like, I'm not trying to hold back information from you. I don't want you to feel like we're on different levels, even though, Fundamentally, we were on different levels, right? In, in basically every sense of the word. 
but he didn't treat me that way. You know, and he didn't treat anybody that way. This was not like, oh, he took a liking to me and he was a jackass to everybody else. And so I remember one time we got some tobacco in and he was breaking it up and he sought tobacco to everybody, right? Uh, you know, to sell. And we actually kept less than we were handing out to other people, right? Handing out to the rest of the homies. Um, he kept the smaller cut and gave the bigger one out and was like, hey, you know, get what you need. And so, you know, a little cut was for him and, and some for me. He gave me my own issue. And I was like, man, I ain't had a cigarette in a while. For, I'm going to smoke one, right? I'm a smoker. I'm a smoke one. And he gives me this lecture, right? And he's like, look, you're going to waste that money, right? You're going to smoke a cigarette. He goes, for one, that shit stinks, right? And what are you going to get a head rush that lasts you a couple minutes? You might get sick to your stomach. It's been so long. And what is that worth, right? What is that cigarette worth? Um, it's worth more than the cheap instant thrill that you're going to get from smoking it, right? And he's very serious. And it was a longer conversation. Um, and, and he made perfect sense in everything that he said. And that's what I told him. I was like, man, you know what? That makes a lot of sense, bro. That makes a lot of sense. And he's looking at me, he's like, I know, right? And I said, I'm going to go ahead and, and smoke one, right? <laughs> and so, and I did. And he was kind of laughing at me and kind of squinting at me like, this, this kid, you know? Um, but he was a cool dude. And, and we had side hustles. He taught me how to, uh, you know, you take the little metal out of the, out of the earbuds that they pass out because they take the speakers out of the, out of the TV. So they pass out earbuds. And he taught me how to make a stinger out of that, which I won't get into the whole thing now, but it's an excellent way to make very hot water. And so, but those little rings that are used, um, if you take a magazine, especially those that are kind of glossy, and you scrape lightly over the different colored parts, you actually make something akin to like crayon dust. And then you roll up your toilet paper and you could do it. And so... Um, and I have some of the stuff, man. Maybe I'll, if I have time, maybe I'll find a way to take some pictures of it and, and you know, post it at the end of this video. But he had a hustle. He would draw, um, you know, Raiders cards and Christmas cards and Mother's Day cards and thinking of you cards. And, and that was his thing, right? I'm sure among other stuff, but that's not, you know, that's not my business. Um, he would send cards out and have them, you know, laminated and, and reproduced and then sent back in. And and so he wasn't sitting around living off of the gente around him, right? And I remember he pointed out somebody that was from a different group segment. I'm not going to get into which one. And he was like, look at that guy. Like, he goes, I know for a fact, man, that dude is a, is a member and has status within another organization. And he goes, look at what he gets at Canteen. Hardly nothing. Right. And and he didn't get to that position just by, you know, wandering into it. Right. And yeah, look how they do him. Folks ain't even looking out for him. And he's like, our northerners get more on canteen or from us than this dude gets. And, and he's a member of, of, of a whole nother organization. Right. And he's like, we can't be like that. Everybody got to have, you know, and, and if somebody doesn't have, and I have, you got it. And if somebody doesn't have, and I, and I don't really have it either to spare, I'll still spare it because the sacrifice falls on me. But this is not a top-down iron fist setup, right? Uh, we're not here to abuse. We're here to uplift. We're not here to ridicule. We're here to teach. Um, it had been common in that era, right, for people... You know, they would leave, the hermanos would, you know, parole, and they'd say, hey, man, you know, I'm going to look out for folks from the streets. And then they wouldn't, and they'd come back. And a lot of times they were getting deemed, right? Like, that was the end of their career. And Carlitos wasn't that way. He never deemed anybody for that. And I watched people leave and come back just in my brief time there. And he's like, why deem them? You know, we don't know their situation. They could have went home and 
and maybe they didn't get a job as fast as they wanted. Maybe they got kids. Maybe they had a relative got sick. Like, who knows? And if you're not going home and functioning within a regiment where there's a higher expectation of, of contribution, then it's not fair to expect that. These dudes are not obligated behind the wall, um, obligated on the streets. They're only obligated behind the wall. If they do look out, that's great, right? Um, but if they don't, they don't. We're not deeming them for that. And, and I respected that, right? He he wasn't big on deeming everybody. He wasn't big on, oh, everybody's going to get whacked. If somebody wanted to walk away, he's like, cool, fool, walk away, right? Uh, if you don't want to be with us, I don't want you with us anyways. You know, now make yourself an obstacle or something, then that's different, right? And, and you're not going to get no love if you walk away, but especially those that were at lower level, lower levels, you know, I'm, I would imagine if it was another C, he would take a different approach, right? Um, or even a really seasoned hermano, maybe. I don't know. But for the most part, he, like, he gave passes. And it wasn't so everybody liked him. And, and a lot of people didn't like him. Uh, he was in a lot of conflict with the Bay for a while, which is a trip because he knew all those guys. Right. And and all the guys that are in the feds now, you know, that's a lot of them are close to his peer group. Right. Tibbs and them go back a little bit further. But, uh, you know, but a good handful of them, he knew he was around during the whole Mateo thing. He was caught up in all that shit. Right. And so but he ruffled feathers up there, too. Right. Primarily for calling out other NF members for abusing their authority or not not living up to the expectations of a C. And so anyways, man, that, that's one of my favorite cellies that I had. Um, that's the that's the most righteous. And I don't say this in a, in a gang sense or I don't say this in a sense to, um, you know, glorify one group as, as compared to another group or whatever. I could just speak for the folks that I was around, right? And I'm sure that there's righteous and upstanding and noble people in, in every organization. And I'm sure that every one of them has, you know, some snakes too, right? But he was, he stood out, right? As that's what I imagined an NF member to be like. And that's who I wanted to be, right? I felt like his spirit already kind of matched with mine in terms of how I viewed status and how I viewed, you know, teaching and how I viewed this, this movement and this cause. And so he really kind of lit a fire, but he would warn me. He'd be like, fool, when you go to classification, you try to stay here. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna go to the Bay, right? Like, that's, I'm gonna go up to the Bay. You did your time in the Bay, you're down here, but I ain't seen it, bro, I wanna go to the Bay. He's like, you don't wanna go to the Bay. It's different up there. The people are different, trust me. You got a good right here, you don't wanna go. And, and I didn't have a choice, right? Like I said, I was on a six-month layover, uh, which was fairly common at the time. And so they had no intentions of me staying in Corcoran. And, and you know, they shot me to the Bay. You know, they, they endorsed me to the Bay um, six months after my initial classification. But but he was a good dude. And, and like I said, we stay friends to this day. Uh, he wound up getting deported, right? Um, him and his cousin. I don't know what his cousin's up to, but that dude was hilarious, right? Hilarious. He had a look in his eye, though, where, like, I feel like he'd be cracking up laughing if he was butchering somebody with a machete, you know? Um, but in in between that time, I never seen him like that. Uh, man, he was a happy dude, laughing and clowning and, and all kinds of stuff. And so they made it a, they made it a comfortable environment. For me, you know, oddly as it sounds. And then I went to the Bay and, and man, he was right. He was right. Uh, I didn't like it. I didn't get, I didn't get what I was looking for, you know? And I think that's one of the things that makes Carlito stick out to me is the rare breed in terms of who I encounter, right? I'm not saying he's the only one like that in, you know, in the NF. But that was the only one I got to spend time with. And and I seen what it looked like. And I never saw that again. Right? I, I never saw that behind the wall again. 
And and it's funny, I talk to him now and he's like, man, if, if I knew then what I know now, right? Because like I say, he turned a county jail sentence into a couple decades, right? Um, and he's like, I would I have signed up for this? Who knows, right? But but I thought it was something, you know, other than. And so I don't want to say he regrets his decision. That's not for me to say. You know, he's a grown man. He can speak for himself. But he, you know, when I had told him, like, man, I used to want to follow in your footsteps. And going to the Bay actually turned me off from that. And he's like, good. And he said, I've had some people get at me, you know, some of my homies and and inquire about that. And, and hey, bro, this is my goals. And he's like, I tell him, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, he stuck true to his commitment because that's the choice that he made and that's the type of person that he is, right? But but sometimes I think you find yourself in a situation and you endure it because you already committed to it and because what's your other choice, right? The other choices are just unacceptable to you in terms of integrity. But that doesn't mean you wish that upon everybody else, right? Oftentimes it's different. And so, as I've said before, this is not just a war story channel for shits and giggles. The point I want to make here is sometimes we have a vision of what it would be like to be somewhere, right? To to reach a certain level. And you may even encounter somebody that, that stirs that in you or reinforces that in you. But that doesn't mean that it's a full picture of what it's like. You know, uh, I remember going to Florida on vacation and I loved it, right? The, it was cheap and the beaches were nice and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, man, I want to live here. And then I moved out there uh, when I was off parole and stuff. But I moved out there. That's when my son was born, my youngest. And I hated it. I didn't even make it a year, right? I hated it. So the vacation was so nice, but the reality of being there day in, day out, nah, I'm cool, right? That's kind of how it was, like, uh, and and sometimes we idealize, you know, the grass is greener, maybe not on the other side, but, you know, a couple steps above. Like, if this is good, if middle management is good, fucking executive director has got to be better. And that's not necessarily true because agendas and priorities change when you move positions, Right. And that's not just prison parts. I mean, that's just life. You know, there's there's people at jobs who become a supervisor and they love it. And then they become a supervisor of multiple supervisors and they voluntarily step back, right? Nah, I don't want that job. You know, because you got to take your work home with you. You don't get to check out after a nine to five or, you know, you got to deal with other stubborn personalities or whatever it may be, right? And, and so beware of that in life. Beware of of seeing one example and feeling like that's the norm. Hopefully for you it is, but oftentimes it's not. And you know the NF is talked about on 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 various channels, and and I'm not saying that what anybody else says about them is wrong, right? For one, everybody has their own experiences. Um, I'm not here to defend them. I'm not here to criticize them, right? As I've said before, I push my own agenda. I'm not pushing anybody else's. And that I'm not necessarily trying to get in the way of other people's agendas. I, I try to offer information from my perspective and what I think is going to help others move in excellence. And but a lot of that stuff is, is the critique, right? It's all about money. It's all about, you know, oppression. It's all about this. It's all about that. And again, I'm not saying that that's not true. It's not my place to say it's not true. And to some degree, I agree with that. Right. When it comes to certain people. And yes, it may be that a lot of the people, you know, that 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 suit fits are also people that are talked about in the public sphere, right? They're getting indicted, their leadership, they're they're kind of household names in the community of people that follow cases like this or or that somehow have an affinity or an interest in in what I'll call the overall, you know, collective of of you know, northerners, northanios, hermanos, and souls, whatever the fuck the language changes all the time. And, and sees. And so, and, and again, I'm not criticizing that, but 
I've seen a glimpse of what could be. Um, I've seen a glimpse of what a responsible position in that looks like. And I'm not saying, I, I'm definitely not saying this to encourage anybody to, to take that route. Uh, like I said, even Carlitos, you know, would, would not encourage somebody to take the route. I'm not saying it's a productive lifestyle. I'm not saying it's the way to be. I'm not saying it's something to aspire to. But I'm saying when you hear about various organizations, and I know some are talked about on other channels by other people. And again, it's not my place to, to confirm or critique what anybody else is saying. But that's not everybody, you know, and as much as some of these organizations may have strayed or may have manipulated or, or, or kind of used some propaganda or whatever, right? There are some, and, and I think they're becoming increasingly less, but there are some who had a vision for something that looks very different than what we see now, right? And... And that's interesting to me. And I'm thankful to wrap it up. I'm thankful that I got to do time with someone like that. I'm thankful that I got to see that. And I think, honestly, that's what helped me to not harbor real animosity. Um, and again, I'll get into the Pelican Bay story next time. But but my my frustrations were tempered by this short, you know, five-month experiencing this cell with this guy and i not helped me and like i said he he remains a friend today he's not a homie he's not my big homie you know i'm, I'm not walking in that in that lifestyle I'm, I'm me right i ain't turned on nobody i'm just me and but he's my friend right and and it's cool to be able to obtain a righteous friendship behind the wall and be able to carry that out here, even though, man, we're not even in the same country, right? And and yet we check in fairly often. And so in the off chance he sees this, shout out to Carlitos. Um, you know, he's mentioned in other platforms sometimes. I wasn't prepared to go there until I talked to him. With that said, man, um, you know, be a homie moving forward. Help yourself move in excellence. Help others move in excellence. And I'll catch you guys on the next one.